So hello, welcome everybody. My name is Jess, uh, the chair of Unlock Democracy, and thank you very much all for coming tonight. Um, we're joined by two members of Parliament who uh, first I'm going to introduce them, then ask them to speak for about 10 minutes. Um, this event, we said it would be about the current state of our democracy, what we can do to reform it and protect it, which is rather a large topic. So expect us to discuss all sorts of things, uh, probably electoral reform. Um, I dare say there'll be a bit about things such as the public order bill, which people were debating uh, last night in second reading. There'll be all sorts of things about how democracy is doing right now, what we can do to protect it. Uh, probably ministerial code will come in there as well. Who knows? The event will run until 7 p.m. So after the 10 minutes, then I will give the two panelists the questions which are based on what we said in the chat. Now, we're going to be quite informal about this. Hopefully, I'm going to try and combine those questions to get through as many as possible. So please don't be offended if uh, sort of half your question gets asked or if it gets squished in with another we're trying to get as much as interesting discussion as possible. Um, so we may end up with some slightly mangled questions, but I hope it will uh, mean a really fascinating chat. So on to our two speakers. Uh, we have two speakers tonight. Neither is afraid to speak out, which is just what we want. Hopefully this will be interesting. Uh, Dan here was elected the Conservative MP for Central Suffolk and North Ipswich, am I right? At so that was 2010. He's been a councillor in two different councils. His background is in health. Stephen Kinnock comes from a political family. He's worked uh, really all over the world. You know, I'm looking here at Sierra Leone, Brussels, Geneva. He's a Welsh Labour MP. He's been so since 2015, I think I'm right there. And I believe you're currently Shadow Immigration Minister. So welcome very much to our two uh, speakers. So on a flip of the coin, can I suggest that Dan goes first? Dan, would you like to speak for about 10 minutes? And I will be timing you, but not exactly. So um, go ahead, Dan, when you're ready. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, Jessica, that's very kind. And, and good evening, uh, every, every, everybody. I, I'm going to speak primarily just to, to two issues, I think, this evening, which uh, will be um, on the issue of... Uh, electoral reform uh, and secondly uh, on uh, House of Lords reform. I think I'll probably start with the latter. Um, you know, I was very pleased. I've served with um, uh, Tom Brake, who's with us here this evening as part of the, as we both served as ministers in the then uh, coalition government. And I think there was a recognition by all political parties at that time that the uh, House of Lords uh, needed to uh, be reformed and we needed to look at um, the role that uh, the second chamber played in our democracy. Um, uh, since that time, uh, House of Lords reform has certainly not been uh, very high on the agenda. Um, but in principle, if we are um, to uh, have a, a democratic process that we can be uh, proud of and we believe in, um, there is a fundamental democratic deficit in our uh, second chamber. And that's not to say um, that uh, we... Uh, we don't value and we don't need um, independently minded people, experts in their fields to be a part of democracy. They bring value, they bring independence, they bring independent scrutiny. But we still have a number of, um, uh, if you like, um, uh, historical uh, aberrations with the Second Chamber. Firstly, um, it uh, is um, far too large. Um, it has, I think there are still around about 800 peers, so it's bigger than the House of Commons. Um, many of those appears are, those peers are increasingly political appointees, but we still have um, over 90 hereditary peers who are not there necessarily on merit, but are there just by simply by dint of uh, the family they were born into. That is something that I've always found unacceptable and doesn't have a place, uh, in my view, in modern democracy. Uh, we also have uh, a number of uh, bishops from the Church of England uh, in uh, the uh, second chamber, um, where you know there, of course, we do have um, a uh, you know, the queen is is maybe head of the church, but we have to I think seriously question whether in a, uh, a, a, a multicultural society, a multi-religious society, in a society where some people have no religion at all, whether it's appropriate or right um, that bishops should be uh, in the uh, House of Lords. Um, so, for a number of reasons, from basic from a basic um, principle um, of 
uh, you know, what what we believe in in, in terms of democracy, um, there are clearly elements of the House of Lords that uh, are well past their sell-by date, if in, indeed they were ever appropriate. And uh, um, uh, you know, priority, I hope, um, for um, a government in in the near future will be um, to look at the House of Lords and um, look at the importance potentially of having um, an uh, uh, elected uh, system, possibly with some appointees. I felt that the bill that was put forward under the coalition government, um, whereby um, the House of Lords would be about reduced the size about 300, with um, something in the reach with two thirds elected um, every with you know, longer terms um, and by proportional representation according to the national share of the vote. Um, was uh, not a bad starting point to come from from the House of Lords for, for the for House of Lords, um, and I also believe uh, and felt um, that uh, you know having some level of appoint appointments, but genuinely independent appointments uh, to the House of Lords um, was also important to maintain that independent uh, expertise that is so important in that reforming and revising chamber. Um, but it, it seems you know in a day and age where we are. Uh, increasingly, many people feel disempowered, disenfranchised from politics. All the more strange that uh, uh, a completely unelected chamber with hereditary elements um, in it has not been reformed. Um, and uh, you know, for me, um, I, I think it, it's an important part of you know having a, a political system we can be proud of and we can trust in um, uh, to make sure that we do tackle the issue uh, of House of Lords reform. Uh, and that is something I would hope that any. A new and incoming government would, would look at much more seriously. Um, the second issue I wanted to talk, speak to was the issue of uh, uh, touched upon with the House of Lords reform is reforming our voting system more generally. Um, I, uh, have, I take a view that you know, our um, uh, part, many of our, our party system in this country is, is quite uh, is has been a, has grown up for historical reasons, uh, and the political parties are very uh, broad churches. It may well be that Stephen and I or Stephen, Tom and I have more in common uh, than we do with some members of our own uh, political parties. And uh, you know, we have uh, at the moment a political, um, uh, a political system that uh, uh, is dominated by um, two, two big parties, um, which are broad churches, but which very rarely in uh, recent history have um, commanded um, a uh, plural have, have commanded when they've been in government a, a plurality of the vote in the last 50 years. I don't think any uh, incoming government has commanded over 50% of the vote. Uh, indeed, it's also been the case that uh, we find that um, uh, the uh, broad churches, such as they are, uh, are often quite uncomfortable coalitions within their own right. Um, and you know, when uh, you know, there are many parts of the country where people um, who may vote for a particular party but their vote effectively doesn't count or feels worthless because of the, the nature of uh, first past the post politics. Um, it means that we have parts of the electorate who feel very uh, disenfranchised. So um, I've uh, also I take and I, I take the view um, that there is a, an increasingly compelling case for reform of our voting system. The other thing I believe is that if we were to move to move towards a, a system whereby uh, different ways of doing this, you can move towards a, an out and out PR system or you can maintain uh, some sort of constituency or regional or, or, or county link through through um, through uh, a, a more proportionate voting system. And that's probably the, the second of those, the system I would probably prefer um, and with some or, or with some form of single transferable vote. Um, uh, that could be uh, could be used. There are a number of systems that could be used, um, but I think a more proportional system, maintaining some sort of local constituency link, is one which would still allow uh, MPs to have uh, a a regional or, or local democratic legitimacy, uh, and there's still a, a link um, to the elector to uh, MPs, um, but um, one um, which would allow a greater proportionality and and um, make each individual vote count more. I think the other thing about electoral reform is yes, it may lead to the formation of new electoral parties, new political parties. It may many countries, you know, that, that, that have um, uh, um, a, 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 a more proportionate system of voting have a large number of political parties. Um, but also, I think it helps prevent and, and 
uh, make sure the UK doesn't ever embrace uh, extremism or extreme forms of government. I think at the moment um, there is always a danger um, with um, you know with, with um, one with the system that we have at the moment um, that uh, although we can have one party government um, that some of the rough edges and some of the poor legislation that any any government any party um, one party may make when it's in government um, there is less but there are less checks and balances on that and if you have a more proportionate voting system either through the nature of having coalition governments or through the nature of having to appeal um, to um, a more have a more consensual politics um, I think that is something that is uh, that, is, that is important and helps guard against uh, uh, extremism in the more uh, general sense um, so for me um, just um, and I'd much rather um, have here I'd like to hear Stephen talk but I'd also much rather take questions um, the two things I like to see to if you like to re-engage voters to help people feel more engaged in the democratic process are reforming the House of Lords uh, and secondly um, making sure that we do actually have a better voting system, a more proportional voting system um, that uh, um, would uh, more accurately represent the views of this country and ensure that um, people are not disengaged and disenfranchised wherever they vote. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, Stephen, how about you? If I pass the ball your way. Thank you very much, uh, Jess, and, and thanks so much to Tom and uh, Unlock Democracy for uh, this opportunity. And uh, can I just start by saying two things? Firstly, I'm very sorry if my camera is blurred. I've just got this my previous laptop conked out and I've got this new laptop. And for some reason, the camera's all blurred and I've got no idea why I'm being technologically useless. I haven't been able to figure it out yet. And secondly, just to say how um, violently I agree with everything that Dan just said um, and not surprisingly on uh, House of Lords reform because uh, I think there is quite broad consensus across uh, the party not unanimous but both, both on our benches and Dan's benches that uh, the House of Lords needs to be reformed but I have to say I think Dan you're the first conservative politician I've heard speaking uh, so positively about electoral reform and and that's uh, incredibly refreshing to hear and I know there's not that many of your colleagues who, who speak out positively, publicly at least. So, you know, kudos to you. I thought that was really, really good. And I agreed with every word of it. I've, I'm a long term supporter of electoral reform myself uh, and also agreed with your view that there are ways of doing it that uh, retain the constituency link, which I think is a really important part of our democracy in uh, here in the UK. Um, and obviously we have experience of it in Wales. Uh, with the Welsh Senate being elected on the basis of proportional representation, I think it's worked very well uh, for us as a system and, and helped democratic engagement uh, in Wales uh, in a way that I think has been very positive. Uh, but I wanted to say a few words, I suppose take a bit of a step back and think a bit about the uh, international and global context to all of this before then diving in a bit on what uh, I'd like to see happening here in the UK and my broad view is quite bleak actually uh, in terms of where we are globally um, for the first time since 2001 the number of authoritarian regimes in the world outnumbers the number of democracies and according to recent uh, research by uh, Freedom House uh, just one in five people live in countries which are categorized as fully free and democratic and they use uh, seven key indicators for that electoral process, political pluralism and participation, functioning of government, freedom of expression and belief, association and organizational rights, rule of law and personal autonomy and individual rights. And when they use those seven measures across the world, both in democratic and non-democratic countries, they find that, that we're going backwards right across the board. Even in countries that are defined as democracies, many of those rights uh, are being eroded. And I think that is a very, very troubling trend and something that I think we have to keep in the back of our minds, not just when we think about what's happening in the world, but also what we when we think about what's happening in the UK, because this uh, insidious creeping of authoritarianism and populism 
and polarization and a kind of post-truth politics is uh, happening under our noses and has been happening for a very long time. Um, and I think we need to be awake to it. I think we've been very naive and very complacent for too long. Uh, and that is something that we are seeing, of course, in its most extreme form with what Vladimir Putin is doing now uh, in, in Ukraine. This is where perhaps uh, he has overreached, perhaps he's sounded the bell that will wake the democratic world up and actually uh, get us to realize that we democracy doesn't come for free. Uh, you have to fight for it. And uh, I, I'm hoping, you know, that perhaps uh, Putin's overreach is uh, a, the wake up call that the world needed. But um, one of the most important things with all of this, of course, in the, it's not just about projecting internationally and building alliances internationally, it's about getting your own house in order. So we have to see what we need to do, the work we need to do here in the UK as a part of that process. And I wanted to just highlight three key areas where I think that there's been concerning developments in terms of the ecosystem of democracy. I mean, Dan has absolutely rightly pointed to the House of Lords as a very important institution in all of this and the electoral process, vitally important. But I think there's a broader piece as well around uh, the actual institutions that we need to defend and the importance of the separation of powers and all of this feeding into a democratic culture, which is sometimes quite hard to put your finger on in terms of what it means uh, tangibly. But I think we all know what it means in terms of uh, the kind of country that we want to live in. And I'm, I've been very uh, concerned about attacks on, our, on the courts and on our legal system. I think we all remember, of course, the enemies of the people front page, uh, identifying judges who are simply doing their job uh, in the democracy in which we live, uh, where the law plays a critically important role. We're seeing constant attacks on sort of lefty lawyers and fat cat judges, for example, who are standing up for people uh, who are seeking asylum. Um, and, you know, they're just doing their job. Lawyers are just doing their job. And uh, I find it very worrying that there's this um, narrative of, of attacking uh, the law. Then we have the media. We're seeing, I think, quite sustained attacks on the BBC and, of course, attempts to privatise Channel 4. Um, I think that that's worrying. And in a way, that really does, I think, play into the hands of authoritarian regimes around the world. As somebody once quipped, uh, the only three political parties who seem to be attacking the BBC are the, the Chinese Communist Party, United Russia, and some elements of the Conservative Party. And I, I think that that's, and, and actually some elements of the kind of more extreme populist side of the Labour Party as well, which I think is deeply regrettable. The BBC is a really important national institution as is Channel 4, that helps to hold our democracy together and keep us resilient and robust. Uh, and I think it seems to be a, the perfect example of shooting yourself in the foot to be attacking institutions like that. And then, of course, there's a civil service. There's a growing tendency, I think, to blame civil servants uh, for failings. Uh, and uh, res the responsibility uh, has to lie, I think, with political leaders to ensure that everybody is clear that advisors advise and politicians decide. And if you start to attack uh, civil servants who can't defend themselves, I think you're also uh, having a, a pernicious effect, effect, undermining effect uh, on democracy because the law, the media, the civil service, they are the checks and balances. Uh, they are what ensures that it's not just at election time that you can hold a government to account, that you have the institutions and the ecosystem in place to hold governments to account, to have those checks and balances in place. And that is the lifeblood of democracy, uh, in my view. The second thing I wanted to talk about was disinformation. So I think we're living in an age of disinformation increasingly. Social media is, of course, turbocharging that. Uh, we are getting troll factories and bot farms, many of which, of course, sponsored and organized by uh, authoritarian regimes and people who seek to polarize uh, and divide by spreading lies and fake news. And I think that that is deeply damaging to democracy because if you can't really identify truth and facts, 
uh, you leave the, the playing field open uh, to people who are going to come in and sell uh, hyper simplistic uh, answers and solutions, which is the beginning of the trend towards populism and ultimately towards authoritarian regime and away from democracy because democracy facts and truth are again the lifeblood uh, of democracy so um big recommendations around that and maybe that's something we can get into in the discussion but i would for example support the um moving away from uh, total anonymity in the sense of yes keeping hold of uh the ability for people to be whistleblowers on social media but I think there's a strong case for saying that you can choose, if you want, to only see tweets uh, from people who have actually had to verify themselves with a piece of with an identity card or whatever it might be with the social media platforms to ensure that there's real people acting, interacting on social media. I think we're, you know, we, we're just going into a parallel universe if we allow uh, social media to be dominated by bots and troll farms how can you possibly have a serious conversation about the about politics uh, or, or whatever issue it might be if you're not even sure you're talking to a human being so i think that that is uh, something that needs to be reformed i also think a political advertising and particularly online political advertising uh, leaves a lot to be desired uh, you know why is it that private businesses that want to advertise their products uh, on the television or on the internet have to go through the advertising standards authority but political parties are not subject to any kind of advertising standards uh, so i would support the recommendations made actually in a house of lords uh, report from 2020 talking about a regulatory committee uh, to ensure that facts and, uh, the, and and information that is provided in political adverts um, isn't just a free-for-all where people uh, can say, say things which are patently false and untrue um, as you know i mean everybody understands that um it you know a lie can just shoot around the twitter sphere uh long before um the truth has had time to put its trousers on and that i think is something that we have to bear in mind because uh social media is playing such a hugely important role in that and the third thing i would flag up is is um what you can what you in a nutshell would call dirty money so um foreign influence and dirty money uh, corrupting our democratic system. We're seeing it, for example, in this trend of lawfare, where um, people with very, very deep pockets are tying up investigative journalists and others who are writing and exposing issues of corruption, uh, issues of influence, um, and all sorts of other nefarious practices. Uh, in the They're being tied up in the courts and the British legal system is very open to this. Uh, and that has to stop. So there has to be legislation to prevent lawfare. Um, I'm very worried about uh, political access from hostile foreign states. We've seen large donations uh, made by people with very close connections to hostile foreign states. And the Electoral Commission and the National Crime Agency are simply not fit for purpose in terms of investigating the true source of donations, where they just don't seem to be able to do that at all and in um, ensuring that donations are from a permissible source. So there's a huge amount of work to do there. I would recommend some, creating something like the Office of Electoral Integrity, uh, where you've got prosecutorial abilities, forensic capability in terms of looking at the source of donations, because we've got to have that transparency in our system if we're going to have trust. Um, so lots to say about political donations. I'm, I'm very honoured to chair the all party parliamentary group on electoral campaigning transparency. We've made a number of recommendations. We did a report a little while ago, or a couple of years ago now, uh, with uh, 20 recommendations around how donations should be registered, uh, that they must come from uh, profits made in the UK, uh, giving the Electoral Commission more powers to prosecute, creating an office for electoral integrity, uh, and a number of other recommendations. So, um, in conclusion, I think that. Uh, in some ways, the most worrying of these aspects is that first one I mentioned about the uh, institutions and the ecosystem, because that's the most abstract, the most difficult for us to figure out how we get around it. And of course, when you've got something, when we're living in a country with no written constitution 
and you've got the ministerial code, but the ministerial code relies on the so-called good chaps theory of government. I just feel that the good chaps theory of government is no longer fit for purpose. I think there's a strong case for a constitutional convention leading to a codified constitution because at the moment trust in politics is at an all-time low and part of the reason for that is because things like the ministerial code rely on um, the, 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 per, the whoever it is uh, in office taking personal responsibility and I, I think that that is a very thin ice that we're treading on then. Um, so there's a huge amount to do in terms of the ecosystem that needs to be reformed but I do feel that Ukraine actually has been a wake-up call. Uh, we've slept through um, the sort of authoritarian revolution by stealth, more and more countries falling into the hands of authoritarians and our democracy being eroded by stealth and people just haven't noticed, they haven't woken up to it. I think Putin has sounded uh, the bell that, that woke us up. We've seen that the European Union is actually able to act quite rapidly and decisively, Who, whoever thought that might be possible because it's about defending our values. It is a union of values. NATO as well has shown capability. The United Kingdom has really stepped up absolutely credit where credit's due, due in terms of supporting Ukraine because we know that Ukraine is on the first line, uh, front line of democracy. Um, but it's not enough. We've got to go further. We've got to go faster. We need those international alliances, but we first of all have to get our own house in order. Don't leave the back door open. We need transparency, vigilance, and deterrence. And there's a lot more to say about all of these things. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, any questions that you Excellent. might have. Thank you very much. Jess. Thank you. I was just about to cut you off there. I was thinking, aha, we've got no time. This is the trouble with all of these, you know, these conversations. There's so much to say. So we've got quite a lot of questions here. We've got 31 open questions. We're not going to be able to get through all of them. But I thought I would start very, uh, very briefly, if you can, and I think I will perhaps time you to two minutes and then hold up this uh, brightly coloured bit of paper here. Um, perhaps, uh, perhaps I could get you both to say first what you think can be done within your own parties with all of these issues, uh, because there have been a number of comments, you know, there. Um, both to Stephen and to Dan, you know, Dan saying, you know, how many other conservatives think like you? Um, you know, there have been a couple of comments there. There have been comments uh, to Stephen saying, you know, what about the next Labour conference? You know, will first past the post be rejected there? You know, so if you could both cover that in as brief a time as possible, that would be splendid. Can I go to Dan again first and then I'll come to Stephen and then next question I'll flip it around. So Dan, go ahead. Okay, so I mean, how do we do it? I mean, one thing I was, I was reading, I was reading through the questions, and I'm not the quickest of typists, so I do apologise. I was going to try and re respond to a couple, but I've, I've, um, it, well, well, you know, while I was listening to Stephen, but I, I noted. But one thing I would say is there was one, one of the comments was about the po having a, uh, a written constitution, and uh, you know, I think that would be, um, you know, for our country, it would be quite a good starting point um, to actually have a written con constitution, um, which would, uh, I think, I think set. Um, uh, uh, and give us an understanding of, you know, how does the United Kingdom, you know, with a devolved United Kingdom, how does that, how, how, how does that work? How does, um, you know, how does, uh, you know, when we talk about issues to do, you know, with um, in the uh, in the Commons to do with, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, you know, you know, the, you know, the um, integrity of. Um, you know, of MPs or, or you know, you know uh, the, the, the primacy of the Commons in 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 certain processes, or you know, in, in that devolved in that devolved settlement, or, or more generally, um, how the relationship between the Commons and the Lords works. Um, and uh, I think having codifying a constitution, um, there are disadvantages to that, but I think actually that would um, help um, bring some clarity to a number of these issues. The difficulty is though, the moment you constitutional issues as we saw you know under, under, you know under the in, in the situation of uh, brexit often get raised um, and get touted at times of crisis or difficulty um, and I think you know it would bring much more faith and clarity to the system if we could um, if we could have a more written and codified 
uh, constitution because it would avoid issues like, for example, that rather uh, strange proroguing of parliament that happened that required the intervention of the Supreme Court to uh, settle the issue. So I think uh, that sort of thing for me would be uh, quite a big step forward and one that would actually stop politicians from behaving uh, irresponsibly um, or in a way that is perceived to be to their advantage rather than to international interest um, because there will be at least uh, a set of uh, constitutional principles which we can uh, apply. Thank you very much. Nicely under time. Thank you. And Stephen, um, some sort of broad question about, you know, what you can do within parties to you. Right. Thank you very much. Here's my uh, dream action plan. And please uh, note that I'm speaking in a personal capacity here. Um, I am on the front bench, but uh, I'm not representing party policy in, in, in what I say, I'm a, in what I'm about to say. But this is what we need to do. We need to uh, secure support for uh, proportional representation at our next party conference. It was very, very close last time. Uh, I think 85% of our constituency Labour Party supported it, uh, but we didn't quite manage to win uh, in the uh, college uh, because not, not all of the trade unions were on board last time. But my understanding is that there is strong and growing support in the trade union movement as well for a shift to electoral reform. So the, the ask is that we commit in our election manifesto to reforming the first past the post system uh, to go to a more proportional system, but without defining what that system should be in the manifesto, but rather to have a constitutional uh, convention um, as quickly as possible after uh, the general election that should not take more than a defined period of time, let's say six or 12 months. I, I'm, I'm I think that's up for discussion, that would come forward with the recommended approach in terms of which uh, voting system we would move to, and that would then go to a vote in Parliament. Uh, because if there is a, uh, if, uh, you know, Le Labour and the other progressive parties uh, commit to um, proportional representation in their manifestos, and we win a majority in Parliament, then that is the mandate uh, for the shift to proportional representation. So that's the first thing that should be done. And um, that I think that there is an opportunity within the uh, Constitutional Convention to also have more um, options in terms of deliberative democracy, uh, both in terms of citizens assemblies to look at some of these issues around creating a written constitution, strengthening the Electoral Commission, strengthening the defence of our democracy and so many of the other things that we need to do. So that would be my ideal action plan. Thank you very much. So both of you have, uh, you've, you've broadly agreed you know, up till now, which is great. Just before we potentially get into areas of disagreement, um, could I ask whether, you know, you've both spoken about, you know, uh, getting people involved, about trust in politics and the, the process of doing that. To what extent do you think the process of drawing up and implementing a written constitution can help to restore trust in politics? You know, is that further down the line? Is that a citizens convention? You know, could you just you know, both briefly outline how this how this trust in politics and how the written constitution and how the citizens convention might all interact? Stephen, can I just come back to you first on that? Yeah, I, I think that there's a um, clear case to think big about the way that our democracy works. As, as Dan rightly said, so much of what we have as a, in terms of our system now is just based on historical precedent. And you sometimes sit in this place, the House of Commons, and you feel like you're working in a museum. It's so uh, backward looking. It's so um, old school in the way that it operates. Uh, and it, we just really need to modernise. The right way to do that is through deliberative democracy, I think. So um, citizens assemblies, constitutional convention, let's have a big national conversation about fixing our democracy. And that's the way to build trust. You build trust through engaging and listening rather than politicians sitting here in the ivory tower in Westminster or this museum and preaching at the rest of the country about what's good for them. You can't do dem democratic reform from inside the Westminster bubble. It's gotta be about reaching out uh, and actually, it's a big part of a levelling up agenda as well, because 
so much of what leveling up is about is, is power. It's not just about financial resources. It's also about decentralizing and letting go. We have the most centralized system of governance in the entire OECD, uh, and that needs to change as well. We can't do leveling up and decentralizing and moving power out of Westminster, moving resources out of Westminster and rebalancing the relationship between uh, uh, the, this place and the people. Uh, without talking to the people. So I would say the way to get through to trust is through dialogue. Um, it can't just be a free-for-all, it needs to be managed, I think, structured to some extent, but there are some very, very good examples of citizens' assemblies and how they can be made to work based on sortition uh, and other methods that the people on this call will be very familiar with. So, you know, I would really support the, a shift to more deliberative me methods in order to get to a place where we can rebuild trust and make people feel that their vote counts and that their voice counts across the country. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Dan, what do you think? Uh, well, I don't, I don't uh, disagree. Um, so I'm, I'm, not I'm not going to uh, uh, waste uh, time when we can probably get into other issues by, by uh, repeating a lot of what Stephen said. I, I agree with that. The only thing I would, I would just add as a, as a, as a slight, um, uh, as an extra point, is that we, you know, we, we do, I think it's important when you're having those discussions and those conversations, be that through a citizens' assembly or how, however you, you do it, um, that you also that you'll understand you know, that there is a proper if you proper um, contribution from, uh, you know, if you're looking working working up, uh, for example, a a, a uh, uh, we, we we can probably pair each other, Stephen. Can we? Or you're not allowed to. That is a really good question, Dan. Yeah, I. It looks like we have to vote. Um, um, I don't know if you've. Um, I suppose we. Yeah, we could. We can pair, we just pair, don't we? we? Unofficially, without talking to the whips, we could we could do that. I think, yeah, we, we can do that. Um, if you're happy to, okay. <laughs> so, great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, as long as you're both happy to do that, yes. we knew this would be a risk. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the advantages of having, you know, the panel from different parties, of course. Yeah. Um, so, so just very quickly, sorry. Um, uh, just you know, uh, just I mean, I think I would think there does need to be um, proper. Uh, input from constitutional lawyers if you're writing a written constitution uh, into that process and also understanding what some of the the trade-offs and the discussions may be and that may have to be fed into the discussion so if you you know if you do things this way um then the consequences will be this um and if you do things that way then that will be the outcome so i think as long as there is that constitutional lawyer input into the process if we're coming towards the process i think i think i agree with everything that stephen said about you know how we should be doing it and what we should be doing thank you that's really useful um there have been a couple of questions in uh the chat which are about the ways in which elections are unsafe but i'd like to add to that the ways in which democracy is unsafe so you know the first question there at the top of the you know the list of questions is does the panel agree that our elections are now unsafe you know and it lists three different ways you know the overseas agents money buying influence you know and big tech and social media you know so you know, we've you know we've touched on those as well can i widen that question and say do we think that not just elections you know do we think democracy is ceasing to be you know democratic you know so our elections unsafe perhaps add into elections things about constituency boundaries risks to gerrymandering um which i have a vested interest in because i used to uh to work for the boundaries commission um but then also democracy being unsafe because i think we'd all agree that democracy is not just about voting there's more you know to it than that but the recent legislation which has gone through um, about uh, protest, the new bill that's come out about public order, um, you know, th those sort of, because of those risks to democracy. So perhaps if we can get into firstly about elections being unsafe, but also about the wider democratic sphere being unsafe. So Dan, if I can pass that back over to you first. I mean, uh... I mean, you know, we, we, we all, um, uh, you know, are very cognizant of what, what's happened in the recent years with the death of Joe Cox and the death of um, uh, David 
Amos, um, and um, you know the, the you know, two you know, very distinguished uh, public servants have paid their paid the ultimate price of their life for um, for that service, and and that's not a place that we want uh, our democracy to be in. Um, but we also don't want to be in a place where we we can't have that face to face time with our constituents. I mean, the thing that I enjoy the most is, you know, when I get back on the train or or, or, or you know, occasionally in the car back to Suffolk on a on a Thursday night, is actually spending the time on Fridays out and about, visiting schools, meeting with constituents face to face, because that's an important part of being an effective and good constituency um, MP. Um, but I think at election time, I think we're particularly vulnerable because you know canvassing doing public meetings and the like you know and you know and, and certainly i'm not aware of a single mp who i've spoken to about this who has not received you know a genuine you know a credible death threat or a credible uh, threat particularly at election time or, or at times of you know heightened emotion around certain votes um and we need to find uh, a way of um uh, you know of um, you know, maintaining open democracy, um, but also providing sufficient protection uh, for for MPs and political candidates at election time. I, do, I don't actually have an easy answer for that for you at the moment. One thing I would say, though, is the um, social media in particular and uh, form and, and the easy ability just to click or send an email have have provided a, a real forum for abuse. And I think uh, I think we. I'm a great believer in free speech, but we need to find a way of um, toning down and having constructive, engaged debate rather than uh, vile abuse being hurled at people just because they represent a particular political party, or they're a particular. They have a, a you know because you know in, in, in worst cases because they're a woman or because they're gay or, or they're transsexual. That that is unacceptable, uh, and and we need to find a way of of dealing with that and tackling with that and and stopping that from happening. I don't actually have any easy answers for you about that, but I, I do fear that the way we're heading is that the ability to have hustings in constituencies um, is going to potentially become a thing of the past unless we can find a way of really dealing with this. And it may mean having a much more active involvement from the police um, actually supporting democracy um, and being present at some of these events in order to make sure that they happen in the way they should and, and that people feel safe participating. Can I just come back about the second part about, you know, democracy, you know, in a much wider sense and um, things around protest, you know, because because democracy is not just voting every five years or four years or, you know, whichever other elections we may vote in. And I vote most years because I live in a council that elects by thirds. Um, but what about the other ways of engaging in democracy? You know, we had a couple of questions about protest and about public order. Um, what are your views about those methods of engaging in democracy? No, uh, look, I'm, I'm, I mean, actually, I, I didn't actually vote last night in the, I mean, in the uh, division on the second reading of the uh, of the, uh, of the, of the, of the bill last night, and I, I'm. I'm slightly uneasy about um, restricting people's right to uh, protest, uh, in, in, you know, because you know, that's something that you know, we, is, is, a, is a right that we all, we all have. We have a right to um, protest, we have a right to make our um, concerns um, with uh, you know, government or local council decision or other decisions clear. And, I, 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 and I'm, I'm uneasy about you know, no matter what the good intention may be behind legislation to deal with, um, you know, and I work as a doctor still, you know, stopping ambulances getting into a hospital, that's clearly not, not an acceptable form of protest. But we have to be very careful in trying to deal with um, very unusual and specific circumstances to not have the unintended consequence that we then uh, impinge very legitimate forms of protest that we've always enjoyed. And, and when we look around the world, um, you know, this country, we have we have the right to protest. We have the right to um, we have the that's something that we're very proud of about our democracy. Um, and I'm concerned uh, that the some of the current legislation that is is going through may make that more difficult. And the unintended consequences um, could be that we 
um, make uh, our country, which should be a bastion of democracy, uh, a country that is actually um, becoming, making making that that right to um, uh, for dissent and right to have your voice heard uh, more difficult for people. So um, that that is something that's going to have to be sorted out um, in this legislation. And I don't think we're quite in the right place um, with the with the current bill that's on the table. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, if I could push that over to you then, you know, both about elections and also about uh, democracy in a wider sense. Yeah, are our democracy, is are our elections safe? I think it's increasingly difficult to answer that question uh, with real confidence uh, in the affirmative. Um, and a lot of that I do think goes back to uh, social media. Uh, I think that we need to stop this anonymity because if everybody knew that the police could identify you immediately uh, if you were to make a death threat, threaten violence, use hate speech, um, I do think that that would um, immediately turn down the dial in terms of the, the heat and the intensity uh, of the abuse um, that is being thrown at, at at, at people, uh, not just to, at, our, at us, but right across the board from one side to the other. And, you know, I, I'm just very worried. We look at the United States, where I think something like two thirds of Republican voters believe in the QAnon conspiracy. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's absolutely bananas and um, it's worrying. And you see the 6th of January insurrection and you see the level of uh, the conspiracy theories that have been bubbling under for years and years and years and we're going all the way back to the time to the clinton era actually and then you know the birth the birth really of social media and the internet these conspiracy theories have been brewing for a very long time and i'm very worried we do sometimes import uh, some aspects of american politics into our country and and you know social media is playing a really big role in that so there's a lot of things we can do to make our elections safer um but i think that, that would be a very big step in the right direction um in terms of and sorry your second question was uh, jessica on so about democracy being eroded and particularly with regards to protest and to public order which protest yes sorry yeah there, uh, no yeah absolutely Pro protest is a cornerstone of uh, any democracy and you know in his most extreme sense we're seeing the way in which people are being put in prison for 15 years in russia uh, for simply calling the war a war um you know it's a, we're just living in this parallel universe where uh lies are just pumped out like a fire hose and anybody that goes against that in places like russia is is put in put in prison and and you know we're seeing thousands and thousands of people now uh who are prisoners of conscience in in russia so that's the extreme example of that's where you know we we have to make sure that we never slip or slide into that and, the, and they're being put in prison because they are protesting. Uh, so that's why we've got to protect the right to protest. But I agree absolutely with Dan that, you know, um, chaining yourself to a road in a way that's preventing an, an ambulance getting past, um, you know, undermining our critical national infrastructure through chaining yourself to something that shouldn't be allowed but there are there are clauses in that bill that i voted against proudly voted against last night around don't make too much noise when you're protesting well the whole point of protest is to make noise so you know we have to be clear that we can't be complacent and that there is a slippery slope and that's why we have to you know some of these things are not negotiable and they have to be protected and these rights the right to protest is one of those uh, absolutely. And then there's some positive steps that we can take in, in terms of dealing with this, the, the scourge of abuse on social media in particular. Thank you. Um, we probably only have one uh, time for one more question, which I'm going to ask about devolution and local democracy, because we've been talking very much at a national level. So in here, we've got a, hang on, I'm scrolling down the many questions. So we have a question uh, which is about real democracy only exists when it engages people at street and parish level. You know, so, you know, how can we, you know, how can we get people standing for local elections? We've also got uh, someone else uh, further down who asked, you know, who said, you know, voters in England dominate the union. 
you know, so would there be a need for a new form of sub-national governance in England? Someone else further down still said devolution, local government. You know, so this is clearly something about where democracy resides. Does it reside at the national level or does it reside further down? So could I ask for your view on how we how we re-empower local communities and how we we uh, we devolve some of that power, which is far too centralized down into uh, national, regional and local communities. Um, Stephen, can I come to you first? Well, I, I do think that comes back to this thing about you can't do if you want bottom up reform, you can't achieve that through your top down methodology. Uh, you have to reach out. And I think deliberative democracy is the right way to go. Uh, if we are going to go towards a, a written and codified constitution, one of the things it needs to do is define the powers that each level of government has and also address the English question. Um, you know, England does not have a clear enough identity in our politics. And I think a lot of people in England are looking at Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland saying, well, they've got a parliament or an assembly and they are, um, they've got that voice in our system. Uh, there's some attempts here through English votes for English laws, but it's just very piecemeal and not clear. So, you know, in typical British fashion, we've made do and muddle through. That's the way that British politics has worked for hundreds of years. And I think we're coming to the point where we can't do that anymore. We do. Has Stephen frozen or is it me? Actually need a blueprint, an architect, but it cannot be imposed from the top out and defining and having those conversations using deliberative democracy. So my answer to it would be, you know, leveling up, distributing power has to be done through um, citizens' assemblies and proper dialogue with the people and the communities that we represent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dan, over to you. Where does democracy reside? At what level? And how can we get it down from the top? Um, well, it's, it's interesting uh, this question because if you, if you if we do devolve more power locally, which is something I, I, you know in principle I, 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 I'm very comfortable with, we would accept there'd be more variation um, in in how different parts of the country are are governed, and and, and we have we have to accept that implicitly as part of that. Um, now, um, I think you know I you know have a lot of uh, time for. Uh, Tony Blair, I, I, you know, he, he, you know, he, 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 one of his, you know, great legacies was actually, you know, devolution, you know, starting the devolved um, settlement of the United Kingdom with Scotland uh, and Wales, and the, but the, he, there was still another step to that, as, as Stephen said. What does that mean for England? You know, does that, you know, should we have had um, regional assemblies? Um, and you know that that may well be a way forward here that we have you know some sort of uh, regional uh, government for uh, England. But underneath that, um, you, some sometimes I think some of our unitary authorities are just too big, um, and they move power away from the individual. So if you're going to move towards a more regional approach, um, perhaps with a regional assembly or something like, you then probably need un sitting underneath that um, proper local councils rather than sort of super councils um, where. Um, people do have um, a sense, a much more sense of community, a local identity, um, where uh, a, a, an attachment at least to that that part of the government, the governing uh, process. Um, but again, this goes back to you know, what we've been talking about, that we need to understand, you know, actually make sense of our constitution. What does this look like? And actually, what does, you know, what does the uh, electoral structure of the United Kingdom look like is a key question in actually understanding our, our constitutional settlement. Tony Blair went a very good way, uh, to, as in many other areas, a good step forward here um, with the evolution for Scotland and Wales. But England was left behind and we, we need to address that as part of that. I floated a couple of potential uh, thoughts on that. Um, you know, I'm not fixed on those as being the perfect solution. But I think that, you know, actually having more genuine local democracy with smaller local councils um, sitting under some sort of um, uh, regional uh, assembly structure may well be uh, a way of tackling the sort of regional issues, um, uh, maybe like transport and the like, um, uh, were also 
um, bringing you know, genuine democracy back at a, at a local council level where people feel more engaged with local decision making. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to both of you. That's all we've got time for tonight. I'm going to hand over uh, to Tom in a moment uh, to just say thank you again. But I wanted to pick out one last question from the Q&A because I thought it was absolutely fascinating, which is whether we need to change our language around democracy and whether we need to more commonly talk about it sort of, you know, democracy by degree rather than binary you know, this is democratic, this is not democratic, and whether actually it's a continuous uh, curve rather than something which is a binary state. Uh, personally, I would very much buy into that, but I think that's the thought perhaps to leave you all with tonight. So thank you to our speakers. Tom, uh, can you say a few words at the end? Hello sure. again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jess. And I really just wanted to thank uh, Dan and Stephen for giving us an hour of their time. Uh, they had uh, nothing to gain, I think, electorally from taking part in this event, uh, nor uh, in terms of their brief in Parliament. So I'm, I'm really pleased they've been able to spend this time with us. And I'm very pleased that we've been able to identify two strong supporters of PR, uh, very rare in the Conservative Party and perhaps not quite as, as numerous in the Labour Party as we would like. So we're, we're very pleased to have identified two allies. And thank you, Jess, for chairing it. And really just to conclude by saying to everyone who is on this uh, webinar tonight that uh, if you uh, have enjoyed this discussion and are committed to seeing the sorts of democratic reforms that have been discussed this evening, uh, such as PR, electoral reform, devolution, uh, passing down power to local authorities, uh, then I hope you will join us as an organisation because that's what Unlock Democracy in the business of, uh, in the business of doing. So thank you all for, for joining us and uh, safe journey homes. Thank you very much. Thank all the best. you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good night.